Discover Geography, Lesson 4-4, Agriculture. Agriculture represents a form of intensification of human use of the natural environment. With agriculture, we are deliberately manipulating our environment in order to increase its production of the things that we want to get from it. And so agriculture lies along a continuum of different levels of intensification that we can have in terms of our use of the environment. So rather than thinking that hunting and gathering in agriculture are completely different ways of making a living, with a sharp break between them, a sort of agricultural revolution, we should think instead of varying levels of intensification, varying levels of manipulation of the environment, and varying levels of increased production for human use that we can get out of it. So we could start with hunter-gatherer societies that largely just take what nature produces on its own. There's very little manipulation of the environment there, and a very low level of production for human use. So hunter-gatherer populations tend to be very low per acre. However, even hunter-gatherers can intensify their use of the environment. The picture you see here is an Aboriginal Australian woman. And the Australian Aborigines are well known for their use of fire to manipulate their environment. They would deliberately set fires in certain areas and deliberately exclude fires from other areas in order to encourage the growth of the kind of plants that they wanted to harvest and to attract the kinds of animals that they wanted to hunt. Their manipulation of the environment went so far in many areas that anthropologists have taken to referring to their practices as fire stick farming, that they were practically farming the land simply through their use of fire without actually clearing fields and hoeing and plowing and deliberately planting crops in the way that we usually think of for farming. So at some point, Hunter-gatherer intensification, increased manipulation of the environment, crosses a line and we start to call it agriculture. This agriculture could be practiced at a very low level of intensification. So something like slash and burn agriculture, or shifting cultivation, is another term for it, is a system in which a certain area is cleared, the plant growth on it is burned, which creates nice fertilizer, releases all of the nitrogen and other important elements that were locked up in that plant growth. You grow plants on it for a little while. Eventually the soil starts to get exhausted and so you move on to a new area. Slash and burn that. The old area is allowed to grow back. And eventually you'll rotate back to that first area. When it's grown back, its fertility is replenished and you can slash and burn it and farm on it again. That's a very low level of intensification because while you may be manipulating your f area where your fields are quite a bit, you have a large area that's not being used at any one time that's being allowed to recover its fertility. However, we could intensify even more beyond that. We could find ways to use the same land for extended periods of time so that we could be farming all of our territory, very, leaving very little of it to rest in between crops. So, for example, rice agriculture in Japan is incredibly intensive. You have a lot of very small fields that are producing a huge amount of rice for human consumption and doing very little else because we've converted those environments into a food production system. That would be a very high intensification form of agriculture. The question that we then can ask is, what are the advantages or disadvantages of moving to a higher level of intensification versus to a lower level of intensification? We often tend to think that obviously m higher intensification, moving from hunting and gathering to agriculture, for example, is obviously a good thing. It's producing more food for us. But in fact, there are a lot of drawbacks to shifting from hunting and gathering to agriculture. On average, farming tends to be more work than hunting and gathering. Studies of modern-day hunter-gatherers who often live in inhospitable environments, places like the Kalahari Desert, where they survive because those lands weren't as attractive to being taken over by agricultural populations, yet they still do a lot less work than neighboring agricultural groups. Farmers may work 10 hours a day, 7 days a week, whereas hunter-gatherers may work only a few hours a day in order to provide for their needs. So shifting to agriculture or any sort of increase in intensification tends to create more work.
agriculture also tends to be a less reliable source of food. With hunting and gathering, because you're gathering more food every day or so, and you're gathering a wide variety of different things because there isn't a lot of any one thing out there. You have to subsist on a lot of different kinds of plants and a lot of different kinds of game that you're hunting. If something happens to any one of those, you can compensate by gathering more of something else. On the other hand, with farming, you're putting all of your eggs in a very few baskets. You'll be growing a very limited number of species as compared to what you'd be subsisting on as hunter-gatherer. And you're going to plant those, grow them all growing season, and then harvest them in one big harvest at the end. So there's a big risk if something happens along there, it could disrupt your food supply. If pests get into it, or a disease hits it, or a hailstorm knocks it all down. Agriculture also tends to be less nutritious than hunting and gathering. We hear a lot of different things about what kind of foods are good for us. And one week fat is good for us, one week it's bad for us. One week this thing is good, one thing, week that thing is bad. But the number one piece of nutritional advice that is always a good piece of advice that's consistent across all of the diet fads you may come across is that you should eat a variety of things. Don't eat too much of any one thing. Well, that's what hunter-gatherers do. They can't eat a lot of any one thing in most cases because there isn't a lot of any one thing. And so they have to diversify their diet. On the other hand, with agriculture, especially when you're just starting out in agriculture, you're going to be dependent on a very small number of different species. So early agriculturalists, such as the Fort Ancient culture in the state of Ohio, is the first agricultural people to live there. Up to 90% of their diet was corn. Just one thing made up a huge portion of their diet. And that's reflected in the health status of those people. Hunter-gatherers live quite long lives. They routinely live into their 60s and 70s. Agricultural populations often have much lower life expectancies in the 40s or 50s. A 40-year-old person in that Fort Ancient culture that I mentioned would have been an extremely old person by their standards. It's only been within the last one or two hundred years, the average life expectancies in industrialized societies that have the advantages of modern medicine and modern sanitation techniques has actually overtaken the average life expectancies of hunter-gatherer populations. So with all these bad things to agriculture, why would someone take up agriculture? Why would you do more work for worse and less reliable food? Well, because with agriculture, you get more yield. You can produce more food per acre. And so if, for example, you have a large population, you may not be able to support that population through hunting and gathering. Hunting and gathering requires a lot of land per person to be able to produce enough food in that manner. Whereas with agriculture, you can feed a lot of people on a lot less land. And that's usually the driver of societies transitioning to agriculture, is that they need to increase their yield typically to feed more people. And so if for some reason they don't need that big yield anymore, say an epidemic has come through and wiped out a huge number of their people, like happened to many Native American societies after contact with Europeans, societies will often switch back to hunting and gathering. Now that they no longer need the high yield, they say, why should we do all that work if we don't need it? Let's go and be hunter-gatherers. Now, increased yield can be helpful to support a larger population. It can also support a different diet. When we talked about biogeography and we looked at the food web, we said that there is a, a huge energy loss at each step of the food web. Only about 10% of the energy that's available at one stage of the food web passes on to the next. And so you can support fewer and fewer organisms at each step of the food web. Every step removed from the plants that you are, the fewer organisms you can support at that level. So this is relevant to humans because we can eat plants and we can eat animals who eat plants. Which means that if we want to increase the amount of meat in our diet, if we want to eat more animals, that means that we have to increase our production of plants to feed them even more. 
if we're feeding them on plants grown in areas where we could be growing things for humans to eat, that means that we're either going to be able to support fewer humans because we have that step in between where we have to feed the plants to animals before humans eat it, or we're going to have to greatly intensify our food production to produce more food to feed to our animals. This is incidentally why all of our major food livestock are herbivores. Cows and pigs and chickens all eat plants because it would be incredibly inefficient to raise carnivores for food on a large scale. If we had to add yet another step, if we had to feed the corn to cows, then feed the cows to dogs, and then eat the dogs, that would mean we'd have to have even more production at the plant level to be able to support the same amount of resulting food at the end. So we can support more people on the same amount of plant production if you're vegetarian than if you're a carnivore. However, meat is for most people and for most societies a higher value food than plants. Most people don't want to be vegetarians. And we see as countries get richer, their populations start eating more meat. So in China right now, for example, incomes in China are rising rapidly in the present day. And we're seeing a big shift from a population that used to eat very close to a vegetarian diet because people couldn't afford to produce much meat. Now as they get richer, they want more meat in their diet. And so we're seeing a big expansion of the amount of production that's necessary to meet the dietary needs of the Chinese population, even as their population stabilizes because their dietary preferences are shifting from closer to vegetarian over to closer to an omnivorous diet more like in the United States. Intensification can continue past simply adopting agriculture into greater and greater levels of production from the same area of land. The current big wave of production increases in agriculture is referred to as the Green Revolution. This is something that began in the middle of the 20th century as scientific techniques were applied to breeding higher yield strains of many of our major food crops such as rice, wheat, and corn. This allowed a big expansion in the yield of some of these crops. And what you see on that diagram is the yield per acre of food grains in the country of India, which was one of the major countries that the Green Revolution was launched in. And you can see a big increase in the yield from the 50s up through the present day. The Green Revolution is an ongoing process. It's a constant process of improving plant varieties and improving the other inputs like fertilizers and pesticides that go along with them in order to try to increase the yield per acre and therefore to expand our world food supply. The current cutting edge in the Green Revolution is the use of genetically modified organisms. So instead of just crossbreeding different strains of a crop to try to produce improved varieties, we can now directly go in and edit the genome of a plant. We can turn genes on and off and we can splice in genes from other organisms, from totally unrelated organisms, in order to get qualities in those plants that we'd like to see. What you see in the picture there is some fields of canola, also known as rapeseed, that's a major oil producing plant. And it's one that is grown in genetically modified form in large areas. Corn, cotton, Soybeans are also very commonly grown in genetically modified form, especially in the United States. The specific genetic modifications that we usually see in the market today are two, herbicide tolerance and insect resistance. By far the vast majority of genetically modified crops being grown right now have one or both of those characteristics. Herbicide tolerance means that those plants are resistant to a specific herbicide. So you often see plants labeled as Roundup Ready. That means they're resistant to the herbicide Roundup, which means that herbicide can easily be sprayed on the field. It will kill the weeds and not kill the genetically modified plants. And so then the genetically modified crops will grow more easily. They won't have competition from, them, from those weeds, and so therefore the yield will be higher. Insect resistance means that those crops produce their own insecticide. They produce their own chemicals that drive away pests. So again, if you can drive away the pests, 
That's going to reduce your losses to the pests and therefore increase the yield that you get out of that for human use at the end. So those two modifications are by far the most common that we actually see in practice today. Now genetically modified crops are extremely controversial. There's a lot of debate over their merits and their drawbacks. In this short video, I can't settle that debate for you, but I can explain some of the major arguments that are made both for and against GMOs. So that as you're figuring out your own opinion on it, you can understand what kinds of arguments your opponents might throw at you. So first, the case for GMOs. What makes genetically modified crops a good idea, according to their proponents? Well, the first and biggest argument they make is increased yield. Under the right conditions, GMOs have the potential to increase your yield per acre, the amount of crop that you're able to get from your fields. And that's a big potential thing in terms of raising farmer incomes, if you can grow more stuff and are able to sell it for a decent price, and increasing food supply if you're growing food crops. The other argument is to point to other potential genetic modifications that are not on the market yet, but maybe just around the corner. So one that's often referenced is something called golden rice, and you see that in the second bowl in the lower picture there. Golden rice is rice that's been genetically modified to have increased amounts of vitamin A in it, which is what gives it that golden color. So vitamin A is in a lot of your orange and yellow vegetables like carrots. In large parts of the world, even though there may be adequate food in terms of total calories, there are certain nutrient deficiencies like vitamin A deficiency. So if we were able to genetically modify crops to have more vitamin A in them, then that could be helpful to those populations suffering from a deficiency. So those are the kind of things that are said in favor of GMOs. The case against GMOs has basically three components to it. First is the worry that it's going to be harmful to people's health to eat. GMOs. The picture you see there of the rats with the giant tumors is from a kind of scare picture or scare link that goes around on Facebook sometimes. The actual research that this is based on is a little shaky. So I'm not going to say that those rat tumors were caused by those rats eating genetically modified feed. But this picture represents the kind of concerns that are raised about GMOs, that they're going to cause health problems for people if we eat them on a large scale for a large period of time. The second type of anti-GMO argument that you hear has to do with the ecological effects. The growing GMOs in fields can have negative impacts on the surrounding ecology. So one famous example is that Pollen from genetically modified corn has been blamed for killing monarch butterflies, that that pollen is poisonous to them, and so it's caused large-scale butterfly die-offs, according to certain studies. The third argument that's made against GMOs is a socioeconomic argument. GMOs are produced by large international agricultural corporations, like Monsanto is the most famous. You can't grow GMOs as just a small farmer using your own seed in the way that you could grow traditional or conventional crops. So a subsistence farmer might traditionally grow some crops, save some of it for seed for the next year, and mostly provide for their own needs and have just a small surplus that they might sell for money to use to buy the few things they can't produce on their farm. You can't pursue that way of life with genetically modified crops. You have to buy those seeds from a large corporation, which means you then have to sell what you grow on the market for cash that you can then use to buy next year's round of seeds. So growing genetically modified crops basically pulls you into the global agricultural market. You can't be a subsistence farmer largely separate from that market. And that market is a very unstable market. Commodity prices for various crops go way up and down from year to year. And so this is something that's a big concern to many farmers. They don't want to get locked into the international agricultural market as their only outlet for what they grow. And yet, if you switch into using genetically modified crops or any other green revolution types of crops, then that's going to be what you're going to have to do.
Despite all of this intensification that's happened and the increases in yield created by things like the Green Revolution, we still see widespread food insecurity around the world. This means inability of people to ensure a steady food supply for themselves. So we see significant undernourishment and hunger in many parts of the world. This undernourishment and hunger is not primarily simply the result of there not being enough food to go around. On a global scale, if you look at, at the total production of food in the world and the total demand for food from all the people of the world, we have more than enough food to go around right now. The world can produce enough total food to feed everyone. People go hungry not because there's not enough total food to go around, but rather because they lack entitlements to any of that food. So famine is the result of a lack of entitlements to food not a lack of food flat out. An entitlement is anything that gives you a claim on a certain type of goods, so in this case, food. So there are a variety of things that might give you an entitlement to food. For example, if you have your own land so that you can grow your own food, that would be an entitlement to that food. You may have monetary income that's sufficient to purchase that food from the market. That would be an entitlement to that food. There may be social obligations. You may have kinship relationships, for example, with people who are obligated to help provide for you. And that's obviously the case for children, for example. A child's main entitlement to food comes from the fact that their parents are obligated by any culture in the world to make sure that their children are fed. You may have other wider ranging social connections that create entitlements that people are expected to provide you with food if you don't have enough of your own and they have some. Or there may be government programs, welfare programs and so forth that you are qualified for and therefore you can gain access to the food in that way. So a failure of entitlements, if you lose your income, if your social network breaks down, if you lose access to your land, that's what's going to create a famine, not necessarily a lack of food overall. And in fact, we sometimes see famines occurring in areas that are producing bumper crops of food. The picture that you see on this slide comes from a famine in India in the late 1800s. India at this point was producing more wheat and rice than it had in any year previously, and yet people were starving in India because they didn't have entitlements to that food. They could not afford it. All of that food was being shipped abroad, mostly to England, where rising incomes were allowing the English people to buy all of this imported Indian food. They were able to essentially outbid the people of India. So they were producing huge amounts of food and yet also starving because they lacked entitlements to that food.